But you know, before I actually begin the message, I want to say something. There are four references in Genesis uh, uh, 7 and 8 to Mrs. Noah. She's just called Noah's wife. She's not even named in the passages. But she's a mom because she has three sons. And, of course, they have wives, so she has three daughters-in-law. She must be an amazing mom and wife to submit to following her husband. Think about it. Noah is marked out as a man of faith, and without a doubt his wife was a great woman of faith too. Obviously, she believed the word of God, and she fully submitted to her husband's uh, uh, leadership and his God-given ministry, and she did so for well over a century. She left all the comforts of home to live an unspecified amount of time with her family in a boat full of animals. She's some phenomenal woman. She's a great mom. She's uh, a tremendous wife, a tremendous mom. And I just want to take a moment and, uh, and pay special tribute to my mom. Uh, mom, thanks for teaching me to wash my hands. It's really been important these last few months. I appreciate that. But more importantly, I appreciate uh, the love for God that you instilled into me as a boy, and uh, a love for Christian biographies and particularly missionary stories. All of that has uh, served me well through the years. And so I thank the Lord for the wonderful Christian mom that God uh, gave to me. And then also, I want to wish and uh, express my thanks for the wife and the mother that uh, has been with me all these years. Now she's a grandma. And uh, I'm thankful for her. Uh, you're really the best thing that ever happened uh, to our family. Uh, and in many ways, she's the source of all that's good and kind in our family. And also, I'm very grateful for the, the two daughters uh, of ours that are moms, and they're good moms. And then we have uh, we have four daughters-in-law, but only three of them have children, and uh, they're very good moms as well, and I'm thankful for that, and I know that the fourth one's going to be a good mom when that day comes. Uh, she's a good mother to her husband, so we're just really thankful for all that God has done. He's been so good to us in giving us moms like this, and you know what? Maybe you haven't spoken to your mom for a long time. I think you ought to break the spell, and I think you ought to speak to her today. If you have a grudge against your mom, if you're a believer, God doesn't like that. He wants you to be right as much as you possibly can with other people. And so get in touch with your mom, and uh, perhaps shock her by uh, calling her or contacting her in one way or another and express your love to her. Uh, regardless, uh, it's a blessing and you need to see it as that. Well, turn in your Bible with me today to Genesis chapter 8, if you will. I want to talk about a new beginning. And while you're turning to Genesis chapter 8, I want to mention this. Do you remember this week uh, hearing about the subway cars being disinfected? Remember that? Uh, I guess one of the highest infection areas for this virus uh, was the subway system. And so... Uh, finally, they got around to disinfecting them, I guess better late than never. Uh, they disinfected the, the subway cars this week. And when I thought about that, I said, you know what? That's a lot of what God was doing with the flood. The flood that we uh, encountered in chapter 7 and now again in chapter 8 is really God disinfecting this wicked world. And he did so with a universal flood. But you know what chapter 8 is? Genesis chapter 8 is really full of hope and courage. Uh, I think that it should be an encouragement to us in our circumstances. Because Genesis 8 is about a renewal and a restoring of this earth after judgment. At the end of that outpoured judgment, in chapter 8, you have a new beginning that really gives hope to God's people and to God's creation. 
And you know what my desire is as we look into Genesis 8 today, this morning? My desire is that you'll be encouraged and uh, that you will be given a hope for a new beginning. That's what we all need. Let's pause a moment and let's pray and then we'll look at the scripture together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you today for, again, the mothers that you've blessed us with. And Lord, you are like a mother to us in so many ways. The way that you nurture your children. Not only a Heavenly Father, but you said, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. Uh, you are a nurturing God, and I praise you for that. And Lord, uh, this morning, open our eyes and uh, show us the new beginning that you have in mind for us, your wonderful redemption plan as we look at the life of Noah and his fam. Lord, we are praising you for all that you are, for all that you do. Save souls and sanctify your people. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Look at the first verse in Genesis chapter 8. And the first few words. And God what? God remembered. God remembered. You know, it's very normal during severe trials to feel that God's forgotten about you. Or even that God has forsaken you. Listen to the word of the psalmist. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? You ever felt like that? And God remembered. The Lord uh, remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. Isn't that interesting? God not only remembered and cared about Noah and his family, but every living thing and everything that was in that ark that God preserved. What does it mean, God remembered? I mean, does God forget stuff? I think perhaps we should, first of all, talk about what it doesn't mean, that God remembered Noah and every living thing. It doesn't mean that he recalled something that he had previously forgot, because God knows all things from the end to the beginning. And uh, he has no memory lapses ever about anything. I remember hearing a preacher say a long time ago, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? He knows everything. He doesn't forget anything. So that's not what it means. What does it mean when it says, and God remembered Noah? What it means is that God retained Noah in his thoughts, that God paid attention to him that God fulfilled his promise to actually the word remembered carries with it the idea to act on something on the behalf of another person to to go into action on the behalf of others that's all inherent in that word remembered God remembered and the implication is that uh, God had made a previous commitment to Noah and now he is ready to fulfill that commitment at this point. So God remembered. God never forgets and God never forsakes his people. His promises to us are guaranteed. Uh, they are rock solid. And you can count on them because he's unchangeable. We sang that this morning. He is the almighty, unchangeable God. He's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind. It's what he says he does. And I'm thankful for that. I remember how the writer of Hebrews picks up on Jeremiah's prophecy. And he says, when the new covenant comes, it will be not like the old covenant that God made with Moses, but it will be a covenant that will be written, uh, that they will know in their minds and will be written in their hearts. And God said, and I will remember their sins and their iniquities no more. God promises that if you place saving faith in the Lord Jesus the Messiah and what he did for you on that tree, on that cross, the Bible promises that all the sin 
that you and I are guilty of committing, it will be as if we never committed them. And God will never bring them up and throw them in our face again. Your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. I hope that you personally have that promise that you can claim that your sins are forgiven. And if not, you can. Uh, you can have that verse become true in your personal life and experience, and there's no reason why it can't except you refuse to believe. So God remembers but then also, I want you to look at the rest of that first verse and then following. Verse 1 in chapter 8, he remembers, And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assaged. That means they receded. They went down. Here I see a second thing that we're going to learn about God, and it runs all the way down through verse 19, and that is not only God remembers, but God renews. God renews. He's restoring the earth to prepare that earth for a new beginning. He's going to restore this earth that was destroyed by the flood of water and give it a new beginning. And the water recedes. We see it there in that verse. In verse 3, it says the waters return from off the earth continually. That is back and forth. We see it in verse 5. And the waters decrease continually. And we see it again in verse uh, 14. And in the second month, the 27th, uh, and the 7th and 20th day of the month, the water on the earth had dried up. And so... God renews the earth. The water begins to recede. The water peaked, according to chapter 7, verse 24. The water peaked at the 150-day point. After five months of this, the water reaches its peak. And the torrential rains that God poured down upon this earth and those underground aquifers, those underground rivers, uh, he stopped up. And uh, then the next five months, first mountaintops begin to appear. And then entirely dry land is visible. So God renews by, first of all, having the water recede. And look at verse 4. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains, plural, of Ararat. So the waters recede as God's renewing. For a new beginning, the waters recede, the ark rests. And notice it's said to rest on the mountains of Ararat. We don't know exactly where that is, but most Bible scholars believe that that is what is today northeastern Turkey on the border of Armenia. And notice I pointed out it is mountains and not mountain, meaning the ark rested in the region of Ararat, on an unspecified mountain and not any particular one. It's in the range and in the region. You know, trying to find the ark has been something that has intrigued the curiosity of people for many, many years. I mean, I've read that since the 1800s, several dozen uh, teams to search on an, exposition, uh, on an expedition for the ark have been sent forth and uh, they've never really found it. You know what I recommend? I recommend that you visit the Ark Encounter in northern Kentucky and you'll see a life-sized replica of the ark. Uh, I want to go there so bad. The people that I have talked to that have been there uh, recommend it. And so I would recommend that instead of going to some place called Ararat, go to northern Kentucky and get a view of the ark there. And uh, so the waters recede, the ark rests, but then here's the part that I really want you to key in on. Verses 6 to 19, Noah remains in that ark. The waters recede, the ark is resting, and Noah remains. In fact, Noah's name is what? Noah. The man that 
would be a comfort. His father gave him that name specifically in uh, Genesis 5, 29. Lamech called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our rest and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And so Noah, this man of comfort, if you will, his father uh, saw in him a hope that he would comfort, that he would bring rest to a weary, cursed earth in some way or another. Perhaps, again, his father may have thought that this is that seed that was promised in Genesis 3.15. But uh, Noah, he's the one that is looked to because of a man of comfort to bring rest to a world. And here the ark rests and Noah remains. And Noah is quite a man of faith. It, uh, it says in the book of Hebrews and chapter 11 and uh, verse 7, regarding him specifically, it says that uh, this man Noah, by faith, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now the key thought that I want you to catch there is that there is only one kind of righteousness that God uh, accepts. And it's a righteousness that is not based upon yourself. It's not based upon your activity. It's not based upon your life. But it is the righteousness that is by faith. It's by depending upon the righteousness of God. And it goes all the way back to Noah. And uh, all the way back to people that have had a relationship with God, it's always been by faith, righteousness. But this man, uh, Noah, was a, a great man of faith, and one of the evidences of that, really, is the fact that he remains on the ark, that Noah keeps still. He remains. One of the greatest aspects and uh, evidences of faith in a believing life is people that wait on the Lord. People that wait on the Lord. My personal experience, God is never in a hurry. I am. God is, in our viewpoint, sometimes slow. We need to learn to wait on the Lord because his time is just perfect. So we're told in chapter 5, Noah walked with God we see also Noah working with or for God in building that ark. We see him witnessing. He's a preacher of righteousness, Peter tells us. And uh, here we see him waiting on God, waiting on God's time. Forty days after the ark rested on the ground, Noah sends out a bird, a raven, a scavenger bird. And uh, that's verses 6 and 7. That bird must have found a lot of stuff to eat because it never came back. So a week later, he sends out a dub. And uh, you can see that in verses 8 and 9. The dub comes back. A week later, he sends out a dub again. And uh, this time, the dub comes back with an olive leaf in its beak. And often, of course, that uh, picture of a dove with an olive leaf is used as a symbol of peace. But I think more importantly here, it represents the lasting promise that God has given to Noah to restore this earth, to grant a new beginning. But then he sends for the third time after a week a dove, and it's the last time that dove goes and it never returns. But still, Noah doesn't move. Still, Noah stays on that ark waiting for God's specific direction to leave. Now, I want to say this. Don't move until you have the clear direction of God. Wait on the Lord, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's what the psalmist teaches us. Noah 
He was a great man of faith. It's seen in the fact that he waits on God, but he's a man that is all about the will of God. Not only doing the right thing, the right way, with the right motive, but also at the right time. Have you ever thought of Noah as like a second Adam? In the sense that God brought the earth originally when he created it out of water for its preparation of Adam to live on. And now he's bringing the earth through a flood of water and he's renewing it for Noah. And they're both given the same mandate. Look at verse 17 where God says, Be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. The very same mandate that God gave to Adam in the first chapter of Genesis. And so it's like Noah is a, is a second Adam. In other words, he becomes the progenitor of a new human race on this earth because the only survivors are him and his wife, his three sons and their wives. And so it's like the human race is having a new beginning. And so a new beginning on a new earth, everything renewed, new for humans, a new beginning for people. Which leads me to my final thought, and that is not only does God remember and God renew, but here God receives, and I want you to see what he receives in verse 20 through 22. When God says to Noah, okay, you can exit, by the way, God shut the door, so I'm sure they couldn't open it anyway. God opens it. God says, okay, now you can leave. So they exit the ark, and as soon as they do so, as soon as they go forth out of the ark with the animals, verse 20, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord. He took of every clean beast and every fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, don't you love that? God says in his heart. What's in God's heart? I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Noah was a man, we're told, that walked with God. He is a man that worked with or worked for God in the building of the ark. He's a man that witnessed for God when he preached righteousness during that 120-year period. He was a man that waited on God, and now his first act upon leaving that ark, he becomes a man that worships God. He builds an altar, and he restores true worship on the earth. All of that had been polluted by the wickedness that was in the hearts and imagination, thoughts of mankind prior to the flood. He restores the true worship of God, his first act upon exiting that ark. And I see in verse 20, in what he does there, a worship that was total commitment to God. And by the way, did you know that's the only kind of commitment God accepts is total commitment. He doesn't want half-hearted worship. He doesn't want you to half commit yourself to him. Total commitment. And uh, notice, he offered to God what he knew would be acceptable to God. Clean animals. You remember, of all the animals, he took pairs, a male and a female. But of the clean animals... He took seven instead of just two. Why? Because he wanted to use them for sacrifice. That was God's plan. He knew God's plan. And here he is using those clean animals that are acceptable to God. You know, if you worship God, it can only be done out of a heart that's clean. You can only do it out of a heart that's clean. The psalmist says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And then he says, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken, uh, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And then, not only is this total commitment seen in his he, uh, pr uh, presenting something acceptable to God, 
but something absolutely for God. See the term burnt offering there in, in verse 20? A burnt offering is the offering of the whole animal. It's a whole sacrifice. And it's, a, it's symbolic of a person giving themselves completely to God. Nothing left out. Making yourself totally available to the Lord. Withholding nothing that you are or that you have from him. Did you know that that verse in Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, based upon all of the wonderful mercies that we are the recipients of in Jesus the Messiah, he begs us that we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. That living sacrifice is representative of a burnt offering, the whole offering, the whole animal, your whole person on the altar to God, a living sacrifice, all that you are, from your head to your toe, from inside to outside, all that you are, all that you have in your possession, it's a absolute for God burnt offering. And all those sacrifices, of course, point to Jesus. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What are those mercies? Those mercies all culminate in Jesus' death and in Jesus' sacrifice for you and I. So, God receives this worship because it's total commitment. And then, look at God's total endorsement of that worship that he's received. In verses 21 and 22, uh, first of all, it's very clear that it's acceptable to God. The Lord smelled a sweet aroma, and the Lord said in his heart, oh, I'll never again curse the ground anymore like this, like I've just done for a man's sake. Basically what he's saying in verse 21, God is saying in his heart, though the human heart is still naturally evil, I have no desire to wipe out the human race like I just did with the, with the universal global flood. You think God delights in doing that? That's the last thing God wants to do. God is merciful. God is long-suffering. God does not want you, me, or anyone to perish. There's coming a day when he is going to once again wipe out this earth, but it won't be with water, it will be with a fire, according to 2 Peter chapter 3. But in the meantime, God extends mercy and compassion to us. This worship of Noah, God endorses it because it's acceptable to him as it's described as him smelling a sweet aroma. And then he gives such wonderful assurance, basically in verses 21 and 22, he says, I'm not going to add any more to the curse that already exists. Remember, he cursed the ground for, Noah's, or, or for Adam's sake. He added to that curse when Cain murdered his brother Abel. But God says, I'm not going to add to that curse any more for man's sake. And I'm never going to send a global flood of water anymore. Neither am I, am I going to disrupt time. There's going to be seasonal changes. There's going to be day and night. That's very meaningful to us. But don't take anything for granted. The sunrise, the sunset. Look at what it says in verse 22. While the earth remain, seed time and harvest, spring and fall, cold and heat, Winter and summer, day and night, sunrise and sunset shall not cease. Don't take that for granted. The sun rising, the sun setting, the changing of seasons, all of those things are signs of a sovereign God, an almighty God, an unchangeable God, and also a very faithful God, a compassionate God that assures us of his loving care. You know, <laughs> seasons change, and that ought to tell you God cares for us.
night ends and day begins. And that ought to tell us God cares for us. God loves us. God's promise to Noah is to guarantee him hope and give him courage, of course, to face the future. And that's something that we can take from this passage as well. Basically, it comes down to this. We're called to live a day at a time. And those days are in his hands. And I want you, because God promises these things, I want you to consider this, that if you have a need this morning for a new beginning, you can have it today. Perhaps the new beginning that you need is new life in Christ. Perhaps you need the life that uh, is a life that is forgiven of sin. A life that comes from God himself to you. If you are in need of a new life, a new beginning in that way, you can have it. And then if you're a believer, what's new about your life? Perhaps you're in need of some spiritual renewal. A new beginning in your spiritual life because of what has gone on. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, all of this is here in this 8th chapter of Genesis. It's to give you courage. It's to give you hope. It's to be something that you can, you can look to God for. You can trust him. You can believe him. And I hope that you will. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for the testimony of Noah. Thank you, Lord, that you brought him through that flood of water safely because you had him secure in that ark. And every person who comes to Jesus and as we said today, receives him by faith, they too can enjoy safety in Christ. And I pray that uh, you would use these words that we have shared today to bring about a new beginning to anyone that has not yet been saved and taken Jesus as their Savior for sin. And then those of us that are our believers, that we would uh, look to you for a fresh renewing in our spiritual lives in these days. We thank you for this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.